years, as excellent as it has been, whew, the singing and the testifying today has just really been phenomenal, along with the communion service and Lydia coming and telling me I got a song to sing. And she was making that song up while she was singing it. So she is definitely a gifted uh, lyricist as well as vocalist. And then she said, but I didn't pray. <laughs> so she said, can can I say excuse me? To, and she didn't say to Elder Tony or Uncle Tony. She said, to the MC, may I say excuse me? Because I didn't pray. I said, say excuse me. <laughs> I sure ain't going to you ain't going to be found on my watch saying, you can't say excuse me if the Lord is saying, pray. Then out of the mouth of babes comes perfect praise. We thank and praise God for that. I thank and praise God for salvation, sanctification, for Jesus and for the Holy Ghost, for your continued prayers. Please continue to pray for me because I need your prayers. Uh, been a week of physical struggle, but Mother Pruitt, thank you for your words of encouragement because it is my goal to just Say, okay, Lord, if you said we can take this mountain, let's go. And I just want to thank you all who uh, trust and and follow. So you, you don't have to. And sometimes it definitely looks ridiculous if we look at it in our flesh. But there's never been a time that God has not come through for us. He's continued to be true. And I serve him. Because when others say, how do you know that there's a God? I know because he's real, real. Jesus is real to me. Oh, yes, he gave me the victory. So many people doubt him, but I can't live without him. That is why I love him so. It's because he's so real to me. He may not be real to others, but I know that he's real to me. And I'm excited because I know that uh, I have witnesses. I have witnesses that are saying me too. I'm not just out here in the middle of an ocean saying, I'm drowning, but God is real. My life is over, but God is real. I'm devastated, but God is real. I'm suicidal, but God is real. No, I'm standing on the promises of God. And when thoughts come that are unlike him, I rebuke those thoughts. When actions occur that are unlike him, I repent of those actions. I seek his face so that I can know him. And I know that if I want to find him, that I can go to his word. If you want to know where Jesus is, go to his word because you'll find him there if you seek him. We thank and praise God. Today, it has been a while. And we can use the word a while like the Bible uses it since we have been able to hear from Apostle Powers on a Sunday morning. But today, we're going to hear from him. He's been incredibly busy at work, and I know that he's been looking forward to coming before the people. But um, the cares of this world are real and have to be attended to. And he also says that if a man doesn't work, then he should not eat. And a lot of people think that that's an Old Testament scripture, but it actually is a New Testament scripture. So that'd be one that I'll tell you to go check it out. Some people say, yeah, that's what they said. No, that's it is. That's a, that's a right now we need to be doing it. So I thank God that we haven't gone hungry. And I thank God for this anointed man of God who's been carrying uh, the call of the ministry for decades at this point. And he is someone who has the word of God uh, in him. <clears throat> and he's also skilled in many natural ways. So when it's natural and it's spiritual, it can be very difficult to navigate through this barren land. But we are blessed to have Apostle Bowers and his voice will be the next one that you hear, uh, Elder Tony, since you said there is a word. From the Lord that that's what I always say and I would just say speak to us speak to us Lord speak to us speak to us Lord for we know you have a word for we know 
You have a word, for we know you have a word, for your people speak to us, speak to us, Lord, speak to us, speak to us, Lord, for we know you have a word, for we know that you have a word, for we know that you have a word for your people. For your people, for your people, for your people, for your people, speak to us. God bless you, Apostle Reverend Dr. Bill Bowers. Amen. God bless each of you. I do give honor to God today and to his son Jesus, to the precious gift and anointing spirit of the Holy Ghost. We thank God for each of you. We thank God for being here this morning. Double honor to our own wife, uh, Mother Bowers. Uh, we thank God for all that he is and all the leaders and all the people that make up this great ministry that God has allowed us to be part of and in so many respects be the leaders of and as Mother said, the founders of. So we thank God for all of those things. I do thank God for Mother Bowers and all that she does and all that she says. I'm so excited that the Lord is uh, healing her and giving her strength and so many tests and trials and tribulations, and yet there she is doing the will of God and the work of God faithfully, dutifully from the hospital, at home, away from church, wherever she's found so doing. And that's what I believe the people of God ought to do is be found so doing. So I'm glad to be here uh, this morning. And there is a word from the Lord. The problem isn't that there is a word from the Lord. There's 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament canonized, but it is the delivery and the messenger <laughs> that concerns me about the word of God. There surely is always a word from God. And we thank God uh, for all that has transpired, your great testimonies that have gone to the glory of God this morning, the anointing and uh, presence that has been brought in this service, the great MC, the technocrats, I'll call them, that are behind the scenes. You never see them, but if they're not there, you wouldn't see each other. Amen. So they are working behind the scenes and all the folks that are holding this ministry up in prayer in finance and giving and in all that you do. I thank you this morning. And I do thank Mother Bowers for allowing, uh, putting Lydia on because I don't believe in the future con future church concept. Some folks say the children are the future church. They're the church right now. I see no minimum age upon which uh, people can become servants and useful in God. When I pray for them, I pray that the Holy Spirit uses them just like I pray the Holy Spirit uses our leadership, amen? Now, Paul said when he was a child, he spoke as a child. So children speak from their own vantage point, but Jesus said, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. We don't get to redefine the kingdom. And so we must accept the children as part of it and do what the Bible said, train them up in the way that they should go. And so I would just say to our minister charity, God bless you for training them in the way that they should go, Josiah and Lydia are well-mannered these days and knowledgeable in scripture and word. And sometimes Josiah is even willing to challenge when I say something, which to me is not a bad thing, amen? Uh, it, it's how we grow. I remember those things when Mother Bowers would say to James and I as we were debating up into the middle of the night, and why don't y'all just quit it? Because to make a preacher, to make a lawyer, to make somebody that can defend themselves, you have to challenge them. You have to. Otherwise, when they get in the arena of life, they won't be ready for the challenges that face them. And so Lydia is well prepared to take her space this morning and sing her song. Amen. I remember, and I haven't been up a while, so you all let me testify for a minute. Uh, I remember not too long ago when the Lord gave me an unction, two things uh, a number of years ago to tell folks to put an altar in their house, consecrate that altar and be ready to use it. And the second thing he said is that everybody should create a psalm of their own and a song of their own that they could present to God. And so Lydia has done that this morning <laughs> in a wholesome way. And so we're glad about it. She's got much lineage of faith around her and it's in her as well. So we're glad on that front. Mother Bauer said that uh, I've been busy with work and I, I really have in August, 
Uh, I was asked to and took on a second entire department at work uh, in the absence of a, a new director in that department. And I kept my old department, but I'm so glad. And, and you know, it's like the work of ministry. I was going to say this, that there are things where you just can't walk away. Mother was talking, um, I believe, in last week or the week before when she was talking about folks that are still a part of but really not uh, functioning as they should be. And one of the things that I know about God is that when he appoints you, he appoints you to stuff until he says, do something else. So you find yourself doing the last thing until God tells you the next thing. And so uh, at work, I am glad to, to tell you that I held two sworn offices and we were able to swear in a new city assessor a week ago. So now <laughs> I'll be back to one job. It's a different one, bigger one, but hopefully the Lord will sustain and allow, as mother said, to work so that we at home can eat. And God has blessed us. Mother and I have been through a lot of stuff, but we have not been forsaken. God has blessed us to have food, raiment, shelter, and income through some very difficult and turbulent waters. And the church sometimes has had to be a part of that through benevolence or through tokens of love or whatever, but it's God. When God uses folks or he uses the job, doesn't matter to me as long as he gets it to us. And so we're glad about that. And I'm glad to be back before you again. Uh, thank God for all of you that have so faithfully carried on and done a great job. Good job this morning, Elder Tony. Uh, and I'm not going to be before you too very long. I'm going to speak to you from the 40th Division of Psalm. And then we're going to go on and be about our business. Elder Tony said it was minus nine, and I can confirm that having been out there. I looked at the temperature in my car on my first attempt to get to the church early this morning. And I literally turned around and went home. It was so cold that my car was freezing up. I put it in the garage and made a second attempt um, because just like at work, when you can't not be on duty until somebody else is, it has been my goal to be speaking to you from the church. So as your voices ring out in my ears, they're in the house of the Lord at the same time. And I've been trying to get here and couldn't get in on Friday night or Saturday morning. And I chipped ice yesterday to make sure that this morning I could get in. And then the cold attempted to stop, the cold weather attempted to stop me. So I'm glad to be here, not endeavoring to be here too very long because I don't want my car frozen to the ground outside. <laughs> but I thank God for having the opportunity to speak to the Lord's people. The, uh, many years ago, I remember seeing Bishop Lewis Henry Ford in Chicago at, at, a, at a great event. His choir, I think, was 10,000 members and I hadn't seen anyone of that magnitude kind of before the mega church thing took off. And one of the things he said that stuck with me three decades later, uh, or I go, yeah, pretty, pretty much three decades later, is he said, a man without followers is just a man taking a walk. So if I log on here and ain't nobody on, I'm just going to walk on out. But when I log on and you're here, <laughs> well, then the Lord must have called me to preach. Hallelujah. God bless each of you. It's wonderful to see and hear you. If you would go with me to the 40th Psalm, and I don't know if Elder Tony's still on, can screen share or whatever. If you've got your Bible, go get your Bible, because we're just going to take an expository look in the 40th Psalm. And it is a great Psalm. It's a Psalm that uh, gives us perspective, but it's important to me because I am working under an unction and a theme from God, and the things that I intend to say coming up will be concerning the will, the word, and the way of God. I'm saying it in prayer. I'm doing it because God has auctioned me. There was a song that the church used to uh, sing a lot years ago, and it was somebody in the church saying, the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. And I talk to people now, and people are fearful and worried and uh, have certain issues. And the only thing I can say to people is that the safest place you can be is in the will of God. Amen. Can you all see me? I'm looking at an image and I can see only the head's cut off. Amen. 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 Not that it's that important, but I just don't Full know how that you all are. Amen. So God bless you. The safest place you can be. When you think about the pandemic, you think about the economic collapse, you think about all of the issues that folks are having, the things that are happening, and the way that our society is running off the rails. Everything that people have depended on is now up for grabs and gone. Even our political structure is evidencing stress uh, to the point that we now have a bunker for uh, Capitol Hill. If you look at the news media, uh, the troops have put themselves round and about and compassed even the halls of government 
have to have troops to stop the onslaught of things that happen. Some of this is when society starts to break down, people start to reach out and they will reach out for the loudest voice sometimes, even if it's not the correct voice. There are many false prophets gone out into the world, Jesus said. Mother spoke about that, I believe, as well, um, that want to draw people into fellowship with what they're preaching, what they're saying, and what they are doing. However, there is only one true God, there is only one true voice, and there is only one right voice. When that was an issue that came up, the father spoke concerning Jesus and said, the whole, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And so we need to make sure that in all of our getting, we get understanding and we need to line up everything we're doing now into the perfect will of God. Because God will allow some things in the life of a believer because we want them even when they are not good for us. I've learned to pray and add the will of God into my prayer because I recognize that there are things that I will bring into my life that will ultimately not be God. I'll struggle with them. I'll good get into them. And then I'll end up asking God, move this thing out of the way because it's hindering the will of God. And I live long enough to now understand it's easier to go and seek the will of God first than finding the will of God on the back end. You can find the will of God in the school of hard knocks, which is go out and do everything wrong. And then you will find at the end of that journey that the Lord is going to bring you back and you'll do your first work over. Well, why would you want to keep doing your first work over? If you've named the name of Christ and the, the seal of the Lord is upon you, uh, you're not going to have liberty that other folks have to just go out and do stuff with no recourse. Judgment begins at the house of God. And now where sir, the sinner and ungodly appear is not today's message, but I will tell you this. When you are a believer, God will hedge up your way when you are trying to do something other than the perfect will of God. Was Jonah in the will of God? All the time. Was he in the perfect will of God? After he came out of the belly of the well, he was in the perfect will of God. You see, permissively, Jonah could say, no, God did not make him go against his will. He made him willing to go. And how did he do that? He let his circumstance become so intensely displeasing that it was more pleasing to seek what God wanted than what he wanted. Some of you right now might be experiencing that place where everything you thought you wanted is there and yet you find no pleasure in it. My friend, you might need to look at whether or not the things that you have desired, because God will give you the desires of your heart, uh, twofold scripture there, he will place them in if you let him, but he'll let you ask for them if you will. And it doesn't always mean it's what God wants for you. And I can tell you this, what God wants for you is better. So where in Psalm is this? We're going to find in verse 6 and 7 where Jesus talks about his very purpose. But the overlying thing that I'm trying to convey to you is think about life during this difficult, uncertain, stressful time as a time when you can draw yourself into that perfect will of God. Because everything else is failing. If you name one social structure, I can tell you that it's failing. I was listening to the uh, radio and they were talking about how many therapists there are now that are overwhelmed because their client base has exponentially expanded. I was listening to one TV show that was just on. I wasn't watching it, so I can't tell you what it was, but something caught my ear because the spokesperson said, everybody needs therapy right now. And I don't know that I disagree with that. I just think everybody needs therapy from God right now. Because you can get the wrong therapist and get the wrong conclusion, but if you get the right God and then you get somebody that's giving you godly counsel, uh, then I'd say amen. Go ahead and get some help and, and all of that. But in all you're getting, get understanding. If somebody's going to talk to me about my issues, I want them to talk me through my issues with an understanding that I'm in the hands of God already. Now, certainly in the multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. So when someone counsels us and they're counseling us according to wisdom, we become more godly. Amen? When folks counsel you according to their own will, you become less godly. It's why John had to say, not my will, but your will be done. Even in times where Jesus said, nevertheless, thy will be done. If there's any other way, move this bitter cup. Well, moving the bitter cup from Jesus Christ's suffering was not the will of the Father. And so Jesus had to relent, even though his flesh, his humanity was crying out for relief. 
he had to relent to the will of God and carry through, go through all the way his suffering all the way to the cross because that was the will of God that brought the glory of God to all mankind. So God bless you. So in thinking about the things that I speak to you about, I want you to know that that is the underpinning where God has told me in this season to get the people to get them in the will, the word and the way of God because his ways are beyond understanding. We must study to find them out. God likes to deal with us in mysterious things and then give us understanding so we can be gratified. Uh, Psalm 40, at uh, first business, 40th vision of Psalm 1, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know that if we will incline to God, if we will wait patiently on God, he will incline to us and he will hear our cry. Too often, our flesh will have us cry out to the wrong folks. We'll cry out to person A about person B and C, and person A has no control, authority, or power over the two people that are creating issues. When you cry out to someone that cannot do the thing that you need them to do, my friend, you're crying out for stress. Stress is when you can identify a problem and you know it's a problem, but you have no resolve of the problem. It puts you in a situation where worry is all that you can produce. And so when you are not willing to cry unto the Lord and then wait for his solution, it means you are willing to accept something short of a true answer. You are willing to accept a complaint rather than a conclusion. In every problem situation, I don't want a complaint. I want a conclusion. And I know sometimes, you know, uh, not as much anymore, but years ago, Mother and I used to do marriage counseling probably two, three, four times a week. And we would find that in many situations, we'd have husbands that were trying to solve a problem that the wife wasn't asking. Amen. And so many times we are trying to do a thing that God is not asking us to do. So much of what we are trying to do is what we perceive of God rather than what we cry unto God and ask God. If you ask him, he'll speak back to you. I remember one of the uh, illustrations that we used in uh, those sessions was that if in fact, and it's probably apropos right now, you know, the wife says to the husband laying in bed, I'm cold. Most husbands are going to get up, get some plastic, put it on the window, seal up everything, turn the furnace up, check everything, put some space heaters around. And what she really meant was, lay a little bit closer. I need you to comfort me. Sometimes we're asking God for one thing and not recognizing that God has already provided within his will a solution. I just want to stop right now and say this. I, I'm going to go faster through the rest, I hope. There are those of you right now that have asked God for a solution and you're waiting for God to apply the solution to your life. Listen, God is a provider. When God has provided the solution, you have to choose it and apply it yourself. When he said, Lazarus, come forth, he said that after the disciples rolled away the stone. When he told Moses to walk in the Red Sea, he told him to put forth his foot. You have to take an action consistent with recognizing that God has provided the answer in his will. Now, the will of God is plain as the book on the table, right? What's your will, O oh God? To do your will, O oh God, is the reason that Jesus came. This is the will of God concerning you, even your sanctification, to be spiritually clean. But there is, as I said, 39 canonized books and 27 in the New Testament that are the will of God. All of it's the will of God. Some of it's to us, and some of it is for us, and some of us, some of it is for example. But to some of you right now, you've been praying and asking God, and I'm here to tell you that God has said, listen, I provided not only an answer, I provided several answers. Are you willing to get in the will of God by faith and say, Lord, I believe this is the right choice. Confirm your word with signs following, because this is the one that I'm doing, believing that it's you. And then confirm the word with your Bible, with prayer, with your prayer partner, and with your leaders. And I believe you'll get on the right track with God. The adversary would have you stressed out because he'll sit you there worrying about a problem where God has provided an answer and you're still worrying, God, are you going to answer me? Well, what you're really saying is, God, come do this thing for me and then I'll believe you've answered. Well, when God provides opportunity, that is your answer.
And then if that opportunity is not working, you say, God, I must have missed it. Give me another one. But you don't want to be found idle doing nothing. Amen. I've asked God for financial blessings and seems like every time he answers me, it's through a job. I'd love him to rain down manna from heaven. But if he answers with a job, I get up and go to work. <laughs> Amen. I get up and go to work in the wind, the rain, the storm, the sleep, the hail, or whatever. In City Hall right now, I'm one of the few folks that is actually working in the building because of discipline that I've had to have to drive over the highways and get there and work. I don't want to lose it by working from home. If I start working from home, I may not have the tenacity to start driving to work again when this thing is over. And it may be your thing that the Lord blesses you when you ask God for a blessing. Maybe a check shows up in the mail. I've seen it happen. I know it happens. I've heard other folks that when they ask God for a blessing, a rich person just made them wealthy just that quick. But for me, it seems that God provides opportunity and skill sets to keep me working. It's because years ago, when I was unemployed, I asked God to let me never have to face unemployment again. I was saved. And there were thousands of people lining up for jobs, and a bunch of them were the Lord's folks. We would line up and wait all day for the opportunity to put in a paper application. And standing in those lines, I said, Lord, I know this isn't your will. Don't let this happen again. So when God provides opportunity, I have to remember that it didn't start off that I was the head of several departments and uh, counselor to governmental leaders and, and, and folk like that. It started off that I was praying to God and asking him for a dishwashing job. If I don't do nothing but testify, y'all, hang on a minute, amen? Um, I remember praying, there was a place called the Sweden House, Scandal House, it was a smorgasbord up on Farm Black in Milwaukee years ago, and there were lines out the door to pray to get a dishwashing job. And I prayed and I got that dishwashing job and I washed dishes faithfully. Uh, we could talk about that sometime because it wasn't a dishwasher, it was scalding hot water and meat. And I went to church thanking God that I was able to wash dishes all day and then get on the bus and go to a church service. That is where I think back to and remember. So when now I'm saying, God, give me stuff, I'm really saying add to the stuff that you've already provided throughout life. Amen. Hallelujah. So in the will of God, we cry unto the Lord. He inclines his ear. And by the way, I moved up from that job up to janitor. <laughs> Somebody say up to janitor? Yeah, custodian was a high job after you wash dishes a, a, a while, amen? I, I, I went and became, and maybe somebody needs to hear this. Somebody might be passing by on a job that's their blessing that don't look like it yet. I took a job in the first Wisconsin center, and my job was to clean the bathrooms in a 40-story building. I would clean them on the way up. I'd clean them on the way down. You could smoke in buildings. You could do whatever you wanted in buildings, so you can imagine all manner of stuff that a 40-story building fully active can produce in a day. I thank God on the way up the steps. I thank them on the way down the steps. I thank them on the way up. But ultimately, I ended up being in the engineering department, which was much nicer, but I never could have got there and, and, and the places beyond there, 40 years of resume backwards, unless I was willing to scrub the floors, clean the toilets, wash the sinks, dump the ashtrays, clean up salt off of the stairs and all those things no one wanted to do because at that point in time that was the job that was available and I thank God for it. Sometimes God has provided the answer. It doesn't look like the answer. It's the doorway on the first floor that's going to get you to the penthouse. You can't get to the penthouse in God just by stepping out. You have to step in and let God exalt you. If you stick with God, he will exalt you in due season. If you humble yourself, he will elevate you, but if you exalt yourself, God will humble you. Well, Pastor, I don't exalt myself. When you say to God, I'm not taking that, you're exalting yourself. Your will is now greater than the will of God. You're not saying what Jesus is going to say, if I can ever get to these verses, thy will, O oh God, I come in the volume of the book to do your will. Or are we in this volume trying to explain to God why he should do what we have decided is best for us? He's omniscient. He already knows. So I said to two, he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a solid rock, on a rock. He has put a new song in my mouth. 
in the midst of all that you are doing, are you willing to sing to God? I'll start a song knowing I am not in the right key or the tempo is not right. Now, when I'm anointed, the key, the tempo, and all of that mixed together. Uh, but I studied enough at the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music to know when I'm off. You all may be saying, oh, Pastor, so off? No, I'm, I'm right on the will of God because I'm making a joyful noise and you are waiting for perfection and you're never singing your song. If you can't sing acceptable to people, cry out unto the Lord with a noise, this noise to you, and I guarantee you between your mouth and someone else's ears, the Holy Ghost will set that tune aright. Everybody can't be like uh, Sister Goldsberry. She might be one of those rare voices that come every now and then, Mother Lily, uh, you know, Sister Charity, some of you all out there that are just exquisite in your voice, but everybody can make a noise. Amen? And so when the psalmist starts talking about uh, He's put a new song in my mouth. If God put it in your mouth, he intends for you to open your mouth and let it come out. Am I right about it? Somebody wave your hand. I'm right. I, I think I got that right. If God put a song in your mouth, Psalm 43, verse 3, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Look at what happens when you allow what's in you to come out. The clock is getting away. I'm going to move on. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Get in the will of God, trust in the word of God, trust in the way of God, and God will bring the things to pass that you are waiting on. But when you're second guessing God, you can't do it because you're double minded and unstable in all of your ways. But blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as to turn aside to lie. I could preach a whole sermon on that given what's happened over the last six months in America. But don't let folks turn you aside by lying to you. Be willing to search for the truth because there are multitudes of liars that will lie you into oblivion, but God is still true. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. We can't know all of the things that God's thinking about when he's blessing us. We can't even testify of it. In fact, the devil would have us not retain God in our knowledge because if we retain God in our knowledge, we retain hope and joy and peace and all of those things. When the enemy can make you uh, get caught up in such a state that you won't recall the goodness of God, I guarantee you he will let you recall the misery of life. He will show you the wicked, the bad, the evil, the wrong. He'll have you watching news reports, but you'll never watch a preacher. He'll have you listening to the horror, but you'll never listen to the glory of God. A testimony will be anathema to you, but you'll listen to the testimony of the world. See, this is where the enemy gets us. He gets in your thoughts, and when he's in your thoughts, now you got to wrestle and get him out. Keep a mind stayed on the Lord, and he'll keep you in perfect peace. You let all these other thoughts, sure, the world is in chaos, but the world is not out of control because God is in control. Amen? There's a difference between being out of control and being chaotic. There is chaos, but God is still in control. I got to move on. So, and it says, Blessed the man who makes the Lord his trust, does not respect the problem, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works. Every day, get up, testify about God. Thank you for the day. Remember something he's done for you which you have done, and your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. God has done more for you than our ability to remember. We have a finite brain and we have an infinite God. So we can't remember all the stuff that God did. If I had every one of you write down everything that God has done for you, you'd be writing a lot. I said at one point, we need a book of testimonies in the church so as you forget, we can go back and read your testimony and we can thank God for what you have forgotten God has done. God has provided shoes on our feet and we forget when we're walking in Stetsons, amen, when we're walking in the better stuff, when we're carrying the finer things and wearing the better clothes and the, the fine jewelry the Bible talks about, we forget that we were the folk that couldn't afford anything and God made a way. So remember what God has done. You asked him to open a door, maybe you didn't like when you got inside, you asked him to open another one and he did it. The, the psalmist is saying, listen, I can't even recount everything that God did, nor can you. But your enemy will cause you to believe that you're in such a state that you're almost forsaken. God has forgotten you. He's not, and you're not. Amen? Many of all of your wondrous works, we cannot recount them in order. If I would, there would be more than could be numbered. Six, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. 
My ears you have opened, burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Do not give God what God has not asked you for. God asked you for the praises of your lips. He put a song in your heart. Open your mouth and give him praise, give him glory. He asked you to remember his doings and make his deeds known among the testimony. He did not ask you to go out and get two turtle doves and sacrifice them or, or a bull or a goat or any of those other things. Burn offering and sacrifice, not what God's looking for. He can, he can get that. Cattle on a thousand hills are here. He wants praise and lift up holy hand and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. We have a job to do in making the world remember we are the conscious of the world. We have to make the world remember there's a God that sits on high and is watching everything. If we don't tell them, who will? And yet we'll get so caught up that we'll tell the world what they already know. Things are bad. Well, they know that. They're bad for you, they're bad for them. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. And I, I, I don't have the time to teach this, but listen. Don't get caught up in giving God what he didn't ask for, even if, it, even if it's what he wanted at one point. When God has moved on, you move on. Be where God is, not where God was. My ears you have opened, burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. Now this is Jesus. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, Oh my God, if we can get to verse eight, I delight to do your will. Why? Because if, if you are delighting yourself in the Lord, you're going to seek God. You're going to want God. You're going to be saying, when can I get back to church and pray and shout and run around the sanctuary? When can I get back to the place where I can clap my hands and hear somebody else? When can I get back to where I can hear a live service and tell my testimony in the congregation? When can I get back to laying hands on the sick folk? physically, not just spiritually. You're going to want to do the will of God. When can I get back to telling folks and watching them get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit? My desire is to do your will, O oh God, or are you kingdom building? You're trying to build a fiefdom for yourself and asking God, please help me build my little kingdom. Well, okay, in the will of God, you can probably get that done, but I'd rather be saying, Lord, I want to do your will, your way. I'd rather have the things of God because the little that a righteous man had is more than the prosperity of the wicked combined. Hallelujah. Somebody lift your hands and wave at me. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. So it says, verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I come, and the scroll of the book is written of me. I delight to do your will. Some folks do the will of God uh, by dispensation. Paul said that he could preach by dispensation, just dispensing the word, but he would rather do it for the glory of God and enjoy doing it. You can preach and not even believe it. There are unsaved preachers preaching. Amen? Bible talks about folk doing it for filthy lucre. Mother talked about false prophets. There are folks that are carrying the word, but they haven't received the word. I'd rather delight in it and let my zeal, my excitement for God testify of how great God is. If I told you the stuff Mother and I are going through, you'd be going, what? I never knew that. No, because I don't tell you all of that. I tell you that God is our deliverer. God is our way maker. God is the door opener. God is our shield and buckler, high tower. He's my way out when you don't even think I'm in. You don't know what I'm going through and you don't know how the Lord is bringing me out because I refuse to give the enemy of God the glory that belongs to God in the house of the Lord. Sometimes, yeah, we testify, but we test the agonizing. Ooh, devil been on my trail all day. Turn around and get him off. God said, I gave you more power than all the power of the enemy. Stop in your tracks and say, in the name of Jesus, loose here and leave me alone. And then go on about the Lord's business. I delight to do your will, O God, O my God, in your law, excuse me, and, verse 8, your law is in my heart. Where do you put the word of God? Hopefully not on a bookshelf or not in an archive. You put it in your heart. In, the, in my heart, I've hidden your word that I sin not against you. I know I'm in the will of God if I keep the word of God in my heart because the word will correct my action before I take it. Wouldn't it be better to never offend somebody than to offend them and have to apologize? I have a, had a boss, he retired now, that told me, it was better to ask forgiveness than to ask permission. I beg to differ. You're much better off asking God before you do a thing, should I do it, than asking God, forgive me after I do. There's a whole doctrine out there of sin and repent, but it's not from God. The word of God in your heart is preemptive 
of the things that are detrimental to you and offensive to God. So he continues, I proclaim the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know that. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. So are you out there truthfully telling the goodness of God, giving explanation for the hope that lies within you? The reason I have hope is because of God, or are you concealing it within your heart? Within yourself, you knew it was God, but you didn't want to offend the sinner, so you didn't say, God bless me this morning. You just said, I'm so lucky. Luck is when preparation meets prayer and opportunity. Amen? But Pastor, you know, somebody's going to be lucky and win the lottery. I don't know. You ought to study what happens to folks that win sudden wealth. It's usually uh, not very long last. I've not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I've declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I've not concealed your loving kindness or your truth from the great assembly. I'll tell the church. I'll testify. I'll let it be known. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord, and let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. Innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my own heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste and help me. Let them be ashamed that brought mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backwards and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be confounded because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha, look, I knew it wasn't going to last. Yeah, there's some editing in there for my part, but that's what folks are saying. Aha, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Remember, we are come. In the volume of this book, we find out how to do the will of God. The will of God is where natural things don't make sense anymore. Amen? They don't make sense anywhere else but in the will of God. Abraham, being too old to bear a child, doesn't make sense in science and biology. It made sense in the will of God. Isn't that right? David, Going up against an armored giant doesn't make sense in the, in the uh, annals of warfare that you send a child out against the captain of a massive army. It made sense in the will of God. You all understand what I'm saying? Amen. Stepping out of a perfectly good boat doesn't make sense. He was a skilled fisherman. He understood Amen. how to nautically get from point A to point B and when the waves were dangerous. The last thing you ever do is step out of a boat. Amen. Anybody that's ever been in a boat, when the waves toss, you hang on. Peter stepped, <laughs> Peter stepped out of a perfectly good boat and started going towards Jesus. It didn't make sense in the boat. It made sense on the water because Jesus was then able to show him that his faith was sufficient by showing him where his faith went short. The will of God kicked in and brought him the rest of the way. Didn't make sense for him to ever be out there. Some places you are right now, it doesn't make sense for you to be out there. But if you know it's the will of God, hang on, help is on the way. Amen. Amen? So the will of God is where things don't make sense in any other context. The Bible talks about that you ought to work to know that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and be perfect in the will of God, because it is God that worketh in you both to do his will and his good pleasure. I'm telling you, if you're in the will of God, you're in the safest place that you can possibly be, whether it's facing a pandemic, whether it's facing unemployment, whether it's facing relationship issues, children problems, families stressed out, employers going off the rails, stay in the will of God. You'll be blessed and highly favored. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to stop Amen. because the time is far spent. I think the point has been made. Stop worrying. Stop spreading. Stop letting the enemy trick you that this is the worst thing that's possibly ever happened. There's nothing new under the sun. And God is above the sun in every respect. When you look to the heavens, you have to look beyond them to see our God. 
Hallelujah. Glory and honor to God. Bless you now. Lord, let your word be settled in the hearts, minds, and in the lives of your people. Let it accomplish that that you sent it forth to do in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And amen. Back to our uh, Mother Bowers, our MC, where I got this from. God bless you.